In July 2018, it was announced that Scarlett Johansson would star in the film Robin Tug, playing the role of Dante Tex Gill, a notorious figure in the 1970s who ran a series of massage parlours as fronts for brothels for the Pittsburgh Mafia. Though the media at the time would often refer to Gill as a butch lesbian or a woman dressed as a man, in retrospect with a modern understanding of gender identity, it's become clear that Gill was a transgender man, and some of his surviving acquaintances have confirmed this was likely the case. As such, Johansson's casting was seen as yet another example of Hollywood denying proper trans representation. Her initial response didn't help, demonstrating flippancy towards the controversy by bringing up the history of cis actors playing trans roles before her. However, mere weeks later, Johansson decided to drop out of Rub and Tug, and publicly apologised for her initial ignorance. Now, whether you view Johansson's retraction from the project as a genuine attempt to make amends, or just her jumping ship to avoid further bad press, especially since she went through exactly the same thing last year with Ghost in the Shell, her initial statement does still represent a persistent argument against diverse representation. Cis people played trans people to great accolades before, so why can't I? Now, it already went to the pitfalls of trans casting during the last episode, specifically its use by actors as awards bait. It's a practice that often makes being trans seem analogous to having a disability, yet another thing actors often do in order to attract that Oscar gold, and it's this kind of recognition Johansson was clearly going for when she took the role of Gil, instead of, I don't know, using one of the many other Oscar bait tactics that anyone can use, like period pieces, true stories, tragic love, um, the difficulty of being an artist, being Meryl Streep. But Robin Tug is pretty late to the party as it is, because We've already had the major Oscar bait drama that combined pretty much every cliché into the book to tell a trans narrative. I'm of course talking about 2015's The Danish Girl. I love you because you're the only person who made sense of me. Who made me possible. I hate this movie. I genuinely, passionately hate this movie. I have sat through it multiple times now in preparation for this episode, and each time I have only hated it more. Even when I first saw it, which I did while still closeted and very much questioning myself, I knew there was something very wrong with it. It is the definition of a film with noble intentions, but such an ignorance or lack of understanding of the real subject matter that it just fails in all of them. Where do these problems start? Well, right from the adapted subject matter itself. Lily Ilsa Ilvenis, known commonly as Lily Elby, is often miscredited as the first person to undergo what we now call gender reassignment surgery, but that isn't true. That distinction belongs to Dora Richter, at least according to surviving documents. However, Lily was the first to gain public attention, at least in Europe, two decades before the much more publicised transition of Christine Jorgensen in 1952. We know what we know about her thanks to her memoir, along with several contemporary news articles and accounts, but this is a story that has a fair few gaps in it for various reasons. One, obviously this was still very much a taboo story at the time. Two, time is obviously with it accounts, both in people's minds and the documents accounting them. And three, the biggest reason for anything bad happening ever, Nazis. The main base for the advancement of understanding transgender people was the Institute for Sexual Research in Berlin, founded by the pioneering Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld. This is where the first gender confirmation surgeries took place, including Lily's as well as much of the early research into homosexuality and transsexualism in the early 20th century. This all began during the Weimar Republic years after World War I, where Germany experienced a brief liberal period before, well, you know what happened. The building was ransacked and its documents destroyed by a Nazi youth brigade. Much of its staff and patients were either killed or sent to camps, and Hirschfeld himself was forced into exile. Along with the remains of the building being destroyed in a bombing raid in 1944, much of the early research into the trans community was lost, and with it a lot of the facts about Lily's history. But that lack of information didn't stop David Ebershoff! In 2000, Ebershoff published The Danish Girl, a fictionalised account of the life of Lily Elby. And when I say fictionalised, I mean almost entirely made up. Ebershoff himself admitted the book was mostly a work of fiction, simply being inspired by Lily's story and not only filling in the gaps, but changing the well-established facts. For example, Lily's wife in the book is an American called Greta Vaud, instead of the Danish Gerda Wegener. In essence, the novel's just a fantasy based on only the loosest of history, and that's not an entirely bad idea. Some of the greatest love stories of all time are based on absolute hogwash. 
However, that approach to artistic license can be damaging when you're dealing with an already marginalized community. So not long after Ebershoff's book is published and becomes a success, of course Hollywood comes a-knocking for those lucrative film rights. The film adaptation began development in 2004 with screenwriter Lucinda Coxon, and the project went through many different directors and actors. Tom Hooper first came across the project in 2008 but was passed over. However, now after the critical success of The King's Speech and the, um, achievement of Les Miserables, he had the clout to bring his passion project to the screen, bringing aboard frequent collaborator Eddie Redmayne and then up-and-comer Alicia Vikander. Now that seems like an ideal team to bring this story to the screen. Hooper's well known for his historical dramas, and he promised he'd stick closer to the true story rather than Ebershoff's novel. Redmayne himself had just won an Oscar for playing a historical figure, and he'd also recently collaborated with trans directors the Wachowskis on Jupiter Ascending. It is better to accept this than to pretend it isn't true. Is that why you killed her? How dare you! I'm not sure if that helped, though. No! Regardless, it created the sense this was going to be more than just another exaggerated cisgender view of the trans experience. This was going to be something landmark, something special. That, of course, didn't happen. Firstly, the marketing's claim that this is the true story is absolute horseshit. Though it removes many of the fictionalizations of Ebershoff's novel, it keeps just as many, and even adds some of its own extrapolations. Hooper himself admitted as such, in an interview with IndieWire after talking about how he strived to make the film closer to reality, when posed with the question of whether the film was more of a biopic or an adaptation, he admits it is more the latter, and that the extrapolations are mainly indeed down to the aforementioned lack of information. Now, no one should expect any historical film to be 100% accurate, as a lot of the time changes do need to be made to make the story flow better or provide better character motivation. But in this case, a lot of these changes don't feel that way. Instead, they feel like they're there just to cater to the cis-heteronormative average audience, and they're already ingrained assumptions about the trans community, wringing out as much drama and tragedy out of the story as they possibly can. So let's quickly run down some of the more egregious changes made to this story. Both Lily and Gerda are portrayed as being a good decade younger than they were when the main events of Lily's transition began. The couple moved to Paris much earlier than the film depicts, mainly because the city was extremely liberal at the time. Lily was nowhere near as reserved about her trans identity, and Gerda was practically living as an open lesbian. Oh yeah, other than this brief scene, the film makes no mention of Gerda's own queer identity, and uses a new male love interest made up from the novel Hans. Gerda did remarry, but the real Fernando Porta bears little resemblance to Hans. Hans here is a childhood friend of Lily's, which Porta was not, and suggests that Lily had transsexual and androphilic desires since a young age that she merely repressed. There is no historical source for this. Lily did have a boyfriend post-transition called Claude Lejeune, whom she intended to marry and have children with. The character of Henrik seems loosely inspired by Lejeune, but here he is a closeted gay man who was only initially interested in Lily in a vain attempt at heterosexuality. The film depicts Lily and Gerda staying together through Lily's transition process, but the two had actually separated by this point after their marriage was annulled, and she certainly wasn't there when Lily died. The film fails to mention that Lily was most likely intersex, as shrunken ovaries were supposedly discovered during her first surgery. The film also depicts Lily as having only two surgeries before dying due to a complication in constructing her vagina. In reality, that surgery was successful, and Lily actually died after a fourth or fifth operation from heart failure when her body ultimately rejected the uterus implanted inside of her, an experimental operation that has still yet to be successfully performed on a trans woman. As said, all of these changes feel like they're there just to up the drama or make the story seem more marketable. Uh, the main characters need to be younger, there also should be a love triangle, and oh, this major character is sorta maybe gay? Can't have that. In response to why the film has a fictionalized ending instead of the real one, Hooper basically answered, it was more dramatic. He keeps talking about how much respect he has for the trans community, but he often undercuts these intentions by reverting to, this is what was dramatically interesting to me, rather than, this is what the story actually deserves. For fuck's sake, this even stretches to how he picks locations. The final scene depicts mountains in the background. There are no mountains in Denmark. And Hooper knew this. He basically did it because, well, I had a preconceived misconception, and the beautiful mountains in the Revenant made me feel so inadequate, so 
I did it anyway. Hooper consistently comes across like he's trying to be reverent, but his cis-heteronormative point of view, as well as that of Cox in the screenplay, completely blinds them to what their text actually might imply. Which brings us neatly to... Hooper claims that with this film he aimed to subvert the cinematic trope of the male gaze, but I don't think he fully understands how that works. So on paper that seems like a valid idea and could get across the increased anxiety trans people often experience when first out in public, but does it need to be sexualized? Hooper seems to believe that by simply switching the gender of your perspective, male gaze suddenly becomes female gaze. No matter the subject, because the techniques used are still inherently ingrained with male coding, as well as being directed by and shot by men, it still comes across as male gaze. The best example of this problem comes in this scene, where Lily goes to a peep show. The intention here is clearly to show how much Lily desires to be truly female, but because of the framing and Redmayne's performance, it reads more like a man being turned on and finding pleasure in imitating the woman's movements. This perspective also only exasperates the pervasiveness of such things as the Blanchardian theory of transsexualism and autogynephilia. Through this botched technique, Hooper essentially conflates being feminized with being sexualized, thereby framing Lily's desires as something far more perverse and indecent than they actually are. The fetishization isn't limited to just how the story was filmed. Around the time of its release, trans journalist Ronnie Baker got a hold of the shooting script for The Danish Girl, and found that the language Coxon used in the scene descriptions to be, well, problematic to say the least. Take this scene for example, where Lily simply runs her hand through some dresses. A bit of clunky foreshadowing laced with stereotypical symbolism, but ultimately harmless. Now see how that was described in the screenplay. These scene directions read like something out of a Harlequin romance novel, and again treat Lily's condition like something risque or scandalous, which Sure, it was by the standards of the time, but the people back then aren't the ones watching this movie now, are they? The intention of these scene descriptions is to highlight Lily's suppressed feminine desires, but in the process they reduce the idea of being trans-feminine, and femininity in general, down to cliches. Redmayne's performance doesn't exactly help negate this perspective either. Now obviously the main way to fix this would have been to, I don't know, hire a trans actor, but as I said in my last video, that's apparently not an option. To Redmayne's credit, he clearly put a lot of thought into his performance, but I'd say in execution it's almost too much thought. The wispy voice, the way he poses his arms, how he so quickly flips into an overemotional wreck, he leaps at making himself seem as feminine as possible, but it just ends up backfiring and feels like, well, acting. I think I'm terrible. I'm sad. You excuse me. Redmayne did have a history before this film of playing female roles in Shakespeare plays, and that definitely shows. It absolutely feels like he's acting this way in order to compensate, but he's not in a theatre, he's in full costume and makeup, and he's playing a real woman. Hashtag trans women are women. In several scenes of The Danish Girl, Lily attempts to seek help from various doctors regarding her condition only for all of them to deem her insane in some form before finding Dr. Vornacross. Now contrary to what some delightful people on Mumsnet might tell you, transgender people aren't mentally ill, and a common misconception of the condition is that it involves some kind of personality disorder, thanks to things like Psycho, or Silence of the Lambs, or... You know, that's a whole other video topic, we'll, we'll get there one day. Bottom line, I am mentally the same person I was before transition, as are the vast majority of trans people. We are just now more able to freely express ourselves, and doing so actually improves our mental health. However, the Danish girl once again falls prey to this misconception, or at least it will in certain people's eyes. You see, Lily did often refer to her two identities as if they were separate people, but more as a method of separating the two phases of her life rather than an actual mental split. The movie seems to indicate that this is more the case too, and uses those distinctions in a metaphorical sense on paper, but once again the way the film frames it changes the intention. Both Lily and Gerda do refer to Ina Wegner as if he is a totally separate personality. Gerda will call for Lily to bring Einar back, whilst Lily will talk about that's what Einar would have done. And though a more educated audience might be able to read the subtext, a general audience will take that distinction at face value. You can't have your movie deny that transgender people are schizophrenic, 
and then portray them like they're schizophrenic. I need to see Aina. Let me help, please. I need my husband. Can you get him? I can't. I need to talk to my husband. I need to hold my husband. I need him. Now, there are some aspects of this kind of split thinking that are relatable. The way that Lily talks about how she dreams as herself now rather than as Einar. Or how Einar is dead after she begins medical transition. Or even that first mirror sequence. There are moments of this film that really do resonate with the transgender experience, at least in my eyes. However, they are surrounded by depictions that are wrong or could easily be read as wrong. But it doesn't matter anyway. This film isn't about Lily to begin with. It's about Gerda. No, seriously, it is. Now, often when crafting a story, you want to make your protagonists as relatable as possible, so a wide audience is more likely to see themselves in them. The mistake storytellers often make when crafting minority characters is that they define them by their differences, and that approach is how you end up with tokens. It's a difficult balancing act for sure, but the best way to go about it is, yes, highlight your minority characters' individualities, but at the same time you have to show what makes them just like everyone else, and that's how you're going to create sympathy in your audience. However, the problem is so many people mistake empathy for sympathy, so what instead they do is portray these people as tragic, having been afflicted with having to live such a life, and in the process ask the audience to pity them. Gerda is the true protagonist of the Danish girl. She's the first character we see, she has more screen time than Lily, she has more scenes without Lily than Lily has without her, and the movie even drops the whole say the title of the movie inside the movie bit in reference to her. Not only does the framing of the film encourage you to pity Lily for her identity, it sides its sympathies with Gerda and the difficulty she faces for having to deal with her. The filmmakers already clearly shoot everything from a cis-heteronormative point of view, so of course their sympathies more naturally lie with the central character who fits that view most. So don't let that supporting actress Oscar Vikander one fool you, because she is the real main character of the film. Remember, this is the character who started all of this in the first place and directly encouraged it. But then the film suddenly flips and it becomes about how she feels, and how this is affecting her. Not only is this a selfish way of portraying Gerda, it's not even true. As previously mentioned, she was fairly open about her lesbian relationship with Lily, that she actually preferred her feminine persona, that her erotic paintings of her were somewhat of an outlet, and the two of them were even in an open relationship. Pretty trailblazing stuff, but none of that is covered. And yes, a lot of these reports are contradictory and hard to confirm, but at least they have some basis in reality rather than the outright fiction in its place. You should have been there. How could I? Look at me. Not everything is about you. Now, of course, in any film involving someone transitioning who has a partner, you do want to show the partner's perspective on it. There is a sense of adjustment and sacrifice and even mourning on their part, but compared to the person actually transitioning, it's a bloody drop in the ocean. By citing too much on Gerda's perspective, it only serves to make Lily seem like that much more of an other. Getting back to Lily, she ultimately ends up being an unlikable character herself. She is simpering and submissive, she becomes uncontrollably emotional at the slightest thing, and she becomes so obsessed with her transition that it rings her to a near catatonic state. For fuck's sake, even once she's in medical transition, she's frustrating in her self-destructiveness, overdosing on her hormones and rushing into her next surgery before it's time. I'm not saying the negative aspects of being trans shouldn't be portrayed. They need to be seen by a general audience so they can understand the hardships we go through. All I'm asking for here is a sense of balance. Where are the scenes in the Danish girl of Lily, you know, enjoying womanhood, unencumbered, finding peace in her identity, not caring about what anyone else says, finding comfort in an environment that accepts her for who she is? What positivity we do get is defined completely by stereotypically feminine things wearing dresses and makeup, and flirting with men. All we get beside that is one brief scene of Lily finding acceptance in her new job as a department store clerk, and then that's it. For the rest of the film, she spends her time moping around the house, feeling unloved by her wife, and saying she can't even paint anymore because that was Einar's thing. 
The one time she even gets to go to a party as herself, she is quickly scared and ends up hiding away, and then never goes to any others throughout the rest of the film. From what we can glean from history, Lily Elby was actually a fairly brazen and outgoing figure. She would attend parties or go to street parades in full feminine garb and actually enjoy her newfound femininity, often under the guise of pretending to be Einar's cousin or sister, yes, but still out being her true self nonetheless. That's why you can find so many pictures of her, why she was covered by contemporary news, and why she is so often miscredited as the first trans person to undergo gender reassignment surgery. She was pretty open about it, and didn't spend her entire existence moping. It only serves to paint the trans experience in the most tragic of strokes, making it seem like a debilitating condition, rather than the freeing experience it actually is at least when social bigotry is taken off the board. And now you can argue that there maybe aren't enough historical sources to back up scenes like this, but fuck it. You've messed with history this much at this point. Why not make up something to try and portray a trans person in an optimistic light just once? It would allow Lily to be less of a self-pitying wretch. It would actually only increase the tragedy of her death because we'd see how promising her life could have been and, most importantly, it would demonstrate the positivity and life-affirming aspects of being trans that a predominantly cis audience desperately needs to understand. But no, according to this film, we are there only to live sad lives and then die so the normals can have their crocodile tears. Fuck. That. Shit. Overall, The Danish Girl doesn't work as a trans advocacy film because everyone involved in it is looking at it from the wrong perspective. Coxon's script focuses on the superficial and is written like fetish erotica, Hooper's obsession with what is interesting to him warps what should be necessary to the story, Redmayne's performance borders on the cartoonish in his attempts to respectfully portray womanhood, and Vikander, well she's a treasure and her performance is actually quite good, but the script does her no favours. I just wish she'd won her Oscar for Ex Machina rather than this. Like most films of its ilk, it feels more engineered to win awards than to portray any kind of truth. And to the average audience, they'll believe it because, you know, old-timey costumes and attractive actors we like. If you want a better example of this type of film done right, seek out the criminally underseen Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman. It deals with polyamory rather than being trans, but it is far more balanced, heartfelt, and historically accurate. It's a damn shame this thing didn't get more recognition. But as much as I personally dislike The Danish Girl, am I really shedding a tear over it? No, because the tide is already shifting away from that kind of film. A fantastic woman just won an Oscar, Pose has debuted to critical acclaim and has been renewed for a second season, and Supergirl is about to debut the first transgender superhero on television. Though only three years old at this point, The Danish Girl already feels like a relic. Instead of the transgender epic it's set out to be, it feels like the last film of its kind. And we as a community should do our utmost to make sure it is. Robin Tug feels like it easily could have gone down the same route as the Danish girl. But in hitting that roadblock with Johansson's departure, it feels like the world is finally starting to see sense. I do actually hope Robin Tug finds its way to audiences at some point, because the story of Dante Tech Skill deserves to be told on screen. However, it needs to be done with respect and integrity. So to everyone involved in Robin Tug, I'll say this. You can talk all you want about how much respect you have for the trans community and how you were doing just what you thought was good for the film. But you can't use the old, but these guys did it before us excuse anymore. Cast trans actors, respect history, and stop using our struggle to gain sympathy points while you line your trophy cabinets. Maybe then, just maybe, you'll actually make a good film that I'd heartily recommend. Just saying.